19 has highlighted the link between the rights I'm going to look at below and the rights to health, dignity and life. And all are now threatened more than ever before. The right to adequate housing, for example, and there's a link there to the recent special report too on adequate housing and COVID-19. The right to water and sanitation, where privatised water is especially concerning, where income levels are low and unemployment is high. The right to a healthy environment, including air and water quality and noise pollution, waste, biodiversity, and the natural resources, for example, of cities are also a key asset for biodiversity and human enjoyment, including rivers, coastal zones, forested areas and open greenland, and all should be, of course, protected and safeguarded. Political rights are also jeopardised, inclusive governance and the concept of the city of inclusive citizenship, which means the recognition of all inhabitants, whether permanent or transitional, living in legal or informal condition, as legal as citizens of the city. These are all potentially threatened in this current crisis. Now, the negative COVID-19 human rights impacts have been felt in cities both in developing and developed countries. The pandemic is certainly exacerbating social discrimination and injustice towards vulnerable groups. Indigenous peoples, minorities, women, youth, migrants and refugees, and all those living at or close to the poverty line. COVID-19 is exacerbating the negative impacts of neoliberal global capitalism and its ongoing structural failure to fulfil economic, social and cultural rights. Added to these come some, some significant environmental externalities. Now, in terms of the environmental um, degradation we've seen, um, we have heard, of course, about some environmental positives, such as the large CO2 reductions globally from reduced consumption levels. But there has also been a surge in single-use plastic consumption, especially in cities. Greener's Action in Hong Kong, for example, surveyed over 2,000 participants in early April and found that people are ordering food in plastic containers at twice the rate as last year. An understandable increase in plastic pollution from face masks, etc. has also been evidenced. And there is evidence of irresponsible disposing by consumers and poor waste management in many countries. And recently in the UK, we've seen some particularly bad examples of this. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this outside of the UK, but when the beaches were opened up, there was an appalling level of plastic waste left behind. Um, and there's also been um, plenty of examples where surgical masks and gloves, etc., have been inappropriately disposed of, and there is now a proliferation of plastic pollution. There's a very interesting link up there um, to an article where people were quoting there are more masks than jellyfish in the sea. So it's adding to an already appalling problem of plastic pollution. Now, in lockdown in the cities, um, lockdown has resulted in serious concerns about the violation of dignity and other human rights for people living in inadequate and overcrowded houses. Degraded social and family conditions without internet connection, or without access to educational services. There's been a massive increase in people reporting mental ill health during lockdowns. The widespread closure of schools has interrupted the education of more than one billion children. We've also seen what's been called the modern slavery effect, the explosion of cases around the world in both developed and developing countries. And this has tended to affect minorities and vulnerable groups most, such as migrants. And this poses an issue of social and environmental justice, even in developing countries. A very interesting article there um, from the BBC, where modern slavery was at the heart, it said, of the German slaughterhouse outbreak. Um, with such quotes as, I can't even wash my hands and the mains of water are being cut off. And this is happening in Germany. So there's unfortunately a, a, a ton of emerging evidence about these issues emerging at the moment. This then moves us on to the whole idea that we could be facing periods of significant civil unrest around the world. In informal settlements, for example, there's a lack of water and sanitation and inadequate housing, of course. Slums are in many cases the source of increased contagion and difficulty in containing the virus due to the inability to comply with minimum hygiene and social distancing precautions and self-isolation, for example, would be virtually impossible. COVID-19 is sweeping through the populace, high-density informal settlements and to refugee, IDP and migrant camps, where physical distancing is challenging, access to health services is limited, and populations are left especially vulnerable to disease, of course. Around the world, millions of people are already living hand-to-mouth before this crisis. 
Street protests about inequalities and falling living standards were common. People were already frustrated and angry. Against this backdrop, the pandemic is creating further hardship that, if not mitigated, will raise tension and could provoke considerable civil unrest. A very interesting report there on the hyperlink um, from the UN. To the question then of the resilient city, how do we build resilient cities in this crisis era? Countries that have invested in protecting economic and social rights, of course, and in combating inequalities are likely to be far more resilient in that sense. The question then is, could the COVID-19 crisis strengthen the duty of public authorities to fulfil economic, social and cultural rights better? These could be linked, of course, to the rights of health, dignity and life and to the duty to ensure public health for all citizens. Can human rights benchmarks then offer a paradigm for healthy cities? Could the COVID-19 strengthen the right to the city as a framework for a resilient city based on the implementation of human rights and environmental rights? On this, we, can we, we should look at the work of UN Habitat, and the link is there, we heard from, from the representative earlier on. However, let's look at the UK situation for a minute, and this position um, has now become somewhat more mainstream than we would ever have thought from a Conservative government, where the, the idea that the market will not provide, and that there may well be the return of so-called big state. Now, there was a petition demanding universal basic income during the COVID-19, um, the early stages of the COVID-19 crisis, which collected over 100,000 signatures in no time at all. In the UK, this public petition called for the trial of UBI, universal basic income, during the crisis. In, in the first few weeks, I said, it was over 100,000 uh, signatures. There's a, a lot of important people pushing this idea and a lot of support for it. And it could ensure who, home and food security for all UK citizens and support the needs of those who, who basically need to self-isolate and can't work. It would also keep money flowing through the economy, of course. It's been well supported by all parts of the UK, particularly in Scotland, Wales and the southwest of England. Other possible state interventions that we need in this emergency phase in particular to ensure these rights are respected through immediate measures could be equitable access to the provision of basic public services, sanitation and even fresh water regardless of the payment of bills, evictions, bans, rent and mortgage repayment deferments and security emergency shelter for the homeless, expanding domestic violence responses for the victims of abuse. But all of this will require considerable state intervention and financing. To conclude then, these are but some of the myriad challenges unfortunately we now face in the COVID-19 world. Much evidence-based research will be needed and hopefully our working groups can help better inform policy makers' choices to improve people's lives for the better and we welcome your involvement.